Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for thank thank you for, thank you for coming along and uh, listening to this presentation, uh, which we've called um, "Build It Smart." Um, these are the these are the things which I want to uh, talk to you about uh, this afternoon. First of all, a, just a very brief uh, overview of some of the documents that are guiding rebuilding in Christchurch. Uh, and just, just so that you know some of the background that's in behind some of the things we talk about. Then I want to talk about improvements that can be made to houses that, that are damaged and have to be fixed up. Some improvements you, you could perhaps think about doing uh, while that process is going on. And then the third thing I want to talk about is, is some improvements that you could make to existing houses, just in case you're interested in improving the, the resilience and performance of, of the house that you, you currently own or one that you might be thinking of purchasing. And then some things that you might like to consider if you're uh, going to be building a new house. Right. So the first thing in, in relation to d documents that is, is uh, that there's been a huge amount of, of research and studies done now uh, since the Canterbury earthquakes on how we can actually make uh, more resilient and better houses, not only in Christchurch, but throughout New Zealand. And, and this is what we refer to as, as the green zone puzzle. What do you actually have to do? Well, first of all, there's, there's understanding of the land, the future land and performance, and how that will impact on the kind of house that you will build. That, that you will build. And next then uh, is uh, house types and some understanding of, of what sort of types of houses perform better than others, what sort of shapes and geometries and, and heights and stories and things have performed better in earthquakes than others around the, around the city. And, and most of you, if you live in Christchurch, will be familiar with a lot of those things, but it's, it's important to draw your attention to them. The next thing, of course, is, is insurance. And uh, if you're thinking of building or having repairs done, it's all got to be acceptable to insurers. So acceptability to insurers is an another part of that puzzle that we have to put together to make it all work. Hang on. And then uh, ov overarching all of that, of course, is the Building Act and the Building Code, so that what you build has to be within the uh, New Zealand building regulations. And interpreting the building regulations in a post-disaster environment is, is um, something that's required a lot of thought and, and quite a tricky thing. I'll just hold up. This is the document. This, this very, very fat folder is essentially what I've been talking about for the last couple of minutes or so. This is, this is written for building professionals, architects and engineers and scientists and geotechnical engineers and so on, people who... who can understand and put together the regulations and so on. There are there are there are other documents um, that that bring the thing a bit and, and that's it there right in the middle. It, it zoomed in, wasn't it? There are other documents which bring it a little bit closer down to home, uh, which uh, are, are on the Ministry of Building and Innovation and Employment stand, which you might like to pick up and have a look at. And they are written essentially for uh, people who who are fixing up or building houses. Uh, on, on TC3 land in Christchurch. Uh, first of all, below floor work, the kind of things that you need to think about in terms of foundations so that you've got a good secure footing to be putting your house on. And then the kinds of things that you should be thinking about above floor, the above floor work that needs to be done so that you're not overloading the land and the foundations that you've got in the event of, of uh, another shake or a disaster. Now the second uh, item that I wanted to talk, so that's just a background to sort to a very, very brief overview of, of the kind of the myriad of documents and things that have been going on and are continuing to go on so that we build up knowledge about how we can improve uh, the resilience of, of Christchurch and indeed the rest of New Zealand. Things that you could think about though, uh, improvements you could make to houses during repairs and of course uh, the, uh, the insurance companies will obviously only uh, repair back to what you had. But there are a number of people who are able to afford even just a small amount of money uh, to make some sort of improvements. And we would, we would urge people to think about that if it's at all possible. While their house is being repaired, while your house is, is, is being disrupted because there's work going on, it's a good op op opportunity and a good idea to think about some of these other things which can uh, make the house make your house actually a, a, a nicer place to live in. And those are, those are two basic things, is, is thermal comfort, 
So uh, wall insulation, floor insulation, ceiling insulation, uh, windows and double glazing and draft stopping is obviously going to be considerably more expensive. Uh, and then uh, also some sort of alternative heating, op uh, alternative heating, because again, a lot of people have had chimneys fall over and they've had to think about that very carefully. The ones I want to focus on though here particularly are in, in terms of thermal comfort is, is the insulation because I think that that is a relatively inexpensive way of achieving a much better performance out of your house. And then the second thing is structural resilience, improving the, the house's, house's ability to withstand uh, any future shocks which we hope it won't get but which it, which, uh, it might get. And uh, we've, we've learned a lot from the Christchurch earthquakes that lightweight roofing and lightweight cladding obviously perform a lot better than uh, heavier materials. So first of all, uh, thermal comfort and insulation and <coughs> wall insulation. Wall insulation is something which is really quite tricky to do if your house is not broken because it means you've got to take the linings off the insides of the walls or you've got to take the cladding off the outside to put it in. If you are unfortunate enough to be like this house in the picture and have had your brick veneer fall off, then actually you have a wonderful opportunity to put insulation into that wall, which you won't get again. Uh, and so that is something that's, that's well, worth, well worth thinking about if you have that. And, and, and it's, it's, you know, you don't actually have to insulate the whole house. I mean, to do, to do one south-facing wall in a bedroom will improve the comfort level of that house enormously. So, you know, just, just think about all the little things that you can do. Um, you can also, of course, if the internal linings are damaged and have had to come off, uh, think about uh, insulating from the inside. Now, there are some, some tricky things about that because if you actually just stuff insulation, insulation bats against the weatherboards from the inside of the house, and, and of course, weatherboards don't always keep all of the water out, the insulation bats are going to get very wet and actually will probably make the house perform even worse. But there has been some good guidance done on how to do this, and there are some tricks to the trade for putting insulation in from the inside so that it uh, doesn't actually touch the weatherboards and, uh, and will give you a, a nice, warm and comfortable house. And that publication, which uh, ECA, uh, Energy Efficiency and Conservation Authority, and ourselves have put together, is, is available. Uh, for you and your builder or your insulation specialist to, to follow. Now just, uh, there's another um, thing that you might like to look up on YouTube too, which is what I've called there the, the Beacon Pathway, have, uh, their, their Huntsbury project. Beacon Pathway uh, uh, have a, a plan for insulating a number of damaged houses throughout Christchurch, and the Huntsbury project has, has got a nice little clip on YouTube which you can go to and, and have a look, just, just Google it and, and up it will come. And it talks through all of the things that they did in, in a house in Huntsbury, that's why it's called the Huntsbury Project, which has, has vastly improved the thermal performance of that house. <laughs> and as I mentioned there, we, the ECA and MBIE have produced guidance on how to insulate the house from the inside. The other thing about improving performance during repairs is to consider replacing a uh, heavy tile roof, for example, with uh, lightweight metal cladding. It could be uh, what we normally refer to as corrugated iron, or it could be pressed metal tiles, the aluminium or steel tiles, which would be much lighter and don't, don't wobble around and don't shake off when there's an earthquake. And uh, the other thing, too, is, is lightweight cladding. And if there's an opportunity to replace uh, brick veneer and it's still and it's aesthetically... Uh, aesthetically acceptable to you to replace brick veneer with, with weatherboards or, or some other form of lightweight cladding uh, sheet material, then that might be quite a good thing to consider and to talk to your builder about because generally speaking we've found that those, those kinds of things have performed much better. Improvements to existing houses. Um, these are, this is now talking about houses that have not necessarily been damaged, but things that you might like to consider to improve the resilience of your house uh, in, in terms of, of the kinds of learnings and lessons we've had from the disasters in Christchurch. And of course there we have the same things of thermal comfort and insulation and, and windows and heating. Uh, but other things you might like to think about too, which will in, improve what we'd call the resilience of the house, are things like uh, uh, solar water heating and, and solar power. 
because an awful lot of houses in Christchurch for a long time, people's homes, were without services. And it's often quite, uh, often not terribly expensive to in fact improve the, uh, the serviceability of your house through some sort of a disaster by putting in that, that kind of, of, of future proofing and, and so on. And rainwater collection is another thing there which you can do. So again, we'll just have a look at that. In terms of uh, the thermal performance, the same sort of thing applies. Have a, but but if, you, if you've got an existing house that's not broken, obviously you're not going to pull the outside off it. But there may be opportunities to insulate walls from the inside. And certainly don't forget, if you haven't done it, the ceilings and floors, because that is relatively easy to do. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can, could we perhaps take that afterwards? Because there is a roving microphone, and if you could hold on to that, because I think there is... Okay? These are, these are uh, other things that, that you can think about. Um, uh, photovoltaic panels are, are greatly reducing in price, and the more, more that we go on buying them, the, the, the more the price will come down. And uh, solar water heating is also something that you could think about as being uh, an improvement to an existing house. And those are things which we in, in, in the ministry are urging very strongly that people think about in, in existing houses and in new houses. Also, uh, rainwater collection. And there are also, you might not to want to be doing what the people on the right are doing and putting in a huge great tank like that, but there are uh, a, a, a large number of rainwater collection systems uh, that it can be tidily fitted in and around your house. Uh, you need to check with the local authorities about that because some of them have, have uh, caveats over the way that or, or what you use the rainwater for. Uh, there are health issues obviously to do with that, but um, generally speaking, if you're using it as, as grey water for gardening and outside work and, and washing cars and things like that, that's not an issue. And then uh, things that you might like to think about uh, to uh, when you build it, if you're building a new house and if you've got a new house in your sites. And again, the same things crop up, don't they? Structure and foundations, obviously you'll have to get that right for the, for the land that you've got, and wall cladding and roof cladding. Thermal comfort issues and water heating, solar power, and rainwater collection, again, things that you should be thinking about for new houses. There's, there's, um, there's a lot of... Uh, stuff that you, can, that you can buy and put into new houses, but I think it's worth really thinking very carefully about what you want, uh, what you want out of your house and not be guided into thinking, well, we need to just really have a very big house but because you might not necessarily need to have that. So what I've, I've listed here are a few things. Design quality is really important. Make sure that you've actually got uh, a plan that works for you and that you think will work for you through into the future. Look at the uh, sort of location and orientation. It's, it's absolutely possible to build a, a, a brand new house anywhere in New Zealand to the uh, New Zealand building code, which meets all of the insulation and, and performance requirements, and which is absolutely bloody terrible to live in, because uh, the builders built it with all the, the large windows facing south. Uh, this, you drive through subdivision after subdivision and see uh, garage doors being warmed up by the sun. All of those kinds of things, which is really disappointing. And, and in fact, with a little bit of thought and a little bit of uh, consideration by you as a house purchaser, you can, you can actually get a lot of those things put the right way around so that you get living rooms that face the sun, that you get uh, the sun coming in and warming the house up in the daytime. Good, good sort of uh, solar orientation is important. And size is another issue too, because... Um, you know, you don't don't necessarily have to build big to accommodate all of the things that you want, because sometimes that can be done with with clever planning and make sure also that you've included the activities and spaces that you really want, and that you're not paying for things that you don't really need or don't really want. And the, and the last one at the bottom of that list there is 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 perhaps one of the most important things, and that's considering lifetime design. Now, there's a a, a crowd who have got a stand out here called LifeMark. And they have some very good publications. I won't step down again because it keeps losing my voice. But uh, they have some very good publications about how you can actually make a house which, which is serviceable for people in all stages and phases of their life. 
uh, this, this is a, an organization which <clears throat> was initially started off um, as an initiative from Crippled Children's Society, but in actual fact it's, it blo blossomed way out beyond that, and it actually applies to everybody, I believe, in, in, in New Zealand. Think about, think about the kinds of, of uh, access that you get to your house, level access into showers, uh, slightly wider doorways. <clears throat> Very good idea because, you, you know, if, you, you, the, if you're a, a, an elderly person with a walking frame or if you're in a wheelchair, w wider doorways obviously are a good idea. But they're a good idea for all of us because if you come into the house with the two bags of shopping and it's pouring with rain and, you, and, and you're trying to get in fast, it's a real nuisance if you've got a narrow doorway. Um, things like that kitchen that you can turn a wheelchair and round is actually a very good kitchen if you've got a, a, a child in a, in a push chair uh, there while you're cooking, or uh, if you've if you've got a, a sick child propped up, all of that all of that kind of thing, and and you know even uh, accessible bathrooms are, are really a, a great advantage if you've ever had a teenager, a really healthy teenager that's broken a leg in a sporting accident that it's really good to have a house which is very accessible. And we all go through all of those phases in life. So I think, think about the, the, the configuration and size and shape of your house um, and, and how you can get what you really want. This is, this is just an example of um, uh, uh, what we call a simple house or the starter home. And three or four years ago, the, what was then the Department of Building and Housing ran a competition to illustrate uh, how you could build a house, build a house to a, a, a reduced form of the building code that we put out, which was called the Simple House Acceptable Solution. And I just mentioned this because the competition entries were all for houses under 120 square metres, which is not a very big house in, in New Zealand terms. Under 120 square metres, this was the winning design, which has three double bedrooms and two bathrooms and uh, is, is uh, well oriented to the sun. We actually built this house in, in Otara in South Auckland, but, but um, there, were, there were 10 finalists in this, and all of them had wonderful plans and designs, which, which uh, we think worked extremely well. And so there we are. This is, this is the, the plan, and um, I've, I've turned it over there because uh, we actually built it back to front because it was designed differently, but, but that's fine. And I just want to draw your attention to the, the picture on the bottom right-hand corner there. You know, it's, it's becoming increasingly important for all of us to have double garages. Um, and when you think about it, that might be something that you would like to perhaps trade off if, you're, if your budget is a little bit tight. Because, well, I, from personal experience, the, the, we have a, a, a little car that we run around the, the city in, and we bought it quite a long time ago, about the same time as we re-roofed re our house. And I think that that car's paintwork is standing up better than the roof paint that's on our house, which is... Uh, proprietary system, and it sits out in the weather all the time because our, our garage is full of all sorts of other things. And that's really what garages are, I think, for a lot of people. And on this house, you see what's happened is they didn't have to spend a lot of money on a garage. Um, you know, what would it cost for a garage? I suppose it's, it's going to add another fifteen dollars to $20,000 onto your house for a single garage, at least. Um, but this one's just got this great sort of cupboards down the outside of the house, you see, where you can put the bike and garden tools and all that kinds of thing, and a bit of sailcloth over the, over the car. So just think about those kinds of things as opportunities you can think about. There are always other ways you can do things which are often uh, cheaper and actually achieve the same sort of thing. So thank you very much. That's, that's all I really wanted to say was just think carefully about what it is that you're, you're building. Uh, think about whether there are opportunities to get your house actually performing better th in terms of thermal comfort, resilience uh, against um, other events and things like that if it's being fixed up. And if you're building a new house, think about all of those things as well. So thank you. Now we can take questions and I th <coughs> think there is a microphone that can go around. How long did it take? About 15 minutes? Could you keep up? Okay. You mentioned um, capturing solar radiation and lightweight um, structural buildings. Is there a way, is there anything that's been developed as a result of the earthquakes um, so we can easily increase the thermal mass in a lightweight structural home? Well, well I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, lightweight is not mass. But um, 
So I guess probably the, the most sensible thing to do if the, if the foundation conditions will, will allow it is to have uh, a good reinforced concrete slab and, and use that as a thermal mass with a lightweight house on the top. And uh, if you then orient the house well so that if you do have, um, if, if you do have uh, big windows or, or, or French doors, they're the ones that the sun comes in and warms up the slab. The, this, this house that you, you see the living room of there is, is exactly that situation. <coughs> so for houses built on piles and, and repair jobs, there's not really any option for nothing? Not, that anything not a lot, no. I mean, store uh, lots of drinking water. So Store lots of drinking water, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There was a question earlier while I was talking about foam insulation. Is that um, is that still still a question? Yes. Um, what about foam in the uh, cavity between the block and the timber? What do you think of that? That that's not uh, that's um, not 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 injected foam. I, I think that's that's not an option that we would be very keen because of again of dampness issues and and mold growth that can happen where you've got because the the inside of the block inside face of the block has always got to be considered as damp you know it, it, because if you get driving rain it will come through the, the through the through the uh, uh, joints but if you've got a, a blockwork veneer then the, the insulation is best placed within the stud framing okay and keep it clear of the blockwork Why are insurance companies saying no attached garages? Why? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Why are they saying that? Well, my insurance oh, company yours. has said <laughs> we can no longer have an internal garage. Do, do, did they give a reason for that? Do we, do we understand the reason for that? The, the, the only... <laughs> The only thing I can think of that, that might have led them to, to come to that conclusion, and I think it's one that you should challenge, um, is because uh, there were a considerable number of houses which are, I'll just have to wave my hands around here, which are basically an L shape or have, a, have, have an attached garage where the, where the slab has parted company from the, from the house uh, because, of, because the, you know, the, the bits have moved independently. That's the only reason I can think why they might suggest that that's not a very good idea, but it's perfectly possible to uh, make the, the floor slab integral and, and reinforce it through so that you don't have a problem. <coughs> All good? Okay. No more questions? Yes. Oh, we need a, we need a microphone. Do you know what was the capital cost of the of the house that won the competition? This one that's up on the screen. That's right. Um, my mental arithmetic's failing me at the moment, but it was about seventeen hundred and something, seven hundred fifty dollars a square meter. So if you multiply that, multiply that by one hundred and twenty, and that's not including the price of the land. That was the build cost. Now that that was. Um, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of explanation that can go around that. The, the, the competition was actually asking for houses of $1,400 a square metre for multiple build. And uh, we reckon that multiple build usually would reduce the, the price of a house build cost by around about 20%. So this one kind of just comes in, just s sneaks in under that. To, yeah, but, but I do remember it was about $1,750 a square metre. Now that's that's not that's not dirt cheap, but it is at the lower end of the affordable market. Okay. Oh, well, if there's no further questions, thank you very much for listening. That's uh, oh, the one 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 here. <coughs> Why is it 
that um, there's so much cost involved before you build a house. You've got your planning consents, you've got um, brands con uh, fees and that sort of thing. When you're building a house, you talk about your square meterage cost, but on top of that, you've got a terrific amount, probably up to $10,000, to get your consents in that. Now, why is it that these haven't been cut back and brought into a reasonable charge? I mean, Brands is charging, what, something like two, two and a half thousand dollars for their um, permit or, or their contribution to a house. And then you've got the local bodies coming in and you've got all these government regulations that are pushing the price of a house up. Um, we used to build a house and pay, I remember we built a house about eight years ago and I think our building permit was $1,500. And the inspector said to me, you're lucky you're not building in another few months because it's going to be two and a half thousand and it'll keep going up from there. And this is something that I feel that the government should be looking at and you people in the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment should be looking at and saying, why and how can we get rid of these things? Thank you. Yep, I can, I can um, um, empathise with you totally about that and, and there is considerable amount of work being, being done to try and bring those, bring those compliance costs down. Um, ultimately, though, the fees are set by the local authorities and, um, and, and so on. So, um, you know, but, but we, we, we would <coughs> agree that they, are, that they are high and in many cases are, you know, quite prohibitive. You've got to have something in the vicinity of, uh, I think it's about 13 or 15 um, building inspections while you're oh, building. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. That, and well, and that, it gets beyond beyond yes. any realm of sensibility. I yes. mean, who has to go back 15 or 13 or 15 times to inspect a building? And then they're still not liable if there's a mistake. That's right. The, 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 the number of inspections is now being uh, significantly reduced. So I think it's down to about five. Um, so that's so that's good. And again, that was what uh, this project called Simple House was also uh, intended to to address. So that if you actually build uh, with specifications which which come within that with, within that part of the of the of the uh, the building code, uh, you know, basically you can you can get um, you, you know you, you you've, you've automatically got uh, a consent. Uh, the other thing too is, is for um, for multiple build, uh, we introduced a couple of years ago uh, a process called multi-proof, where you can get one, uh, you know, you can get one set of plans consented, and then that can be repeated as, as many times with that one consent, and that's done by by the ministry. It's not done by the local body. So, yep, I mean, it, I, I totally agree. It, it's a it's a big issue. Uh, we do have to make sure, of course, that, that there are the right number of inspections, that things are done and that they're done safely and well and that we don't have further weather tightness issues and all of that sort of stuff. But, I, I, you know, it's also got to be done at a price that we as a, as a nation can afford and, and homeowners can afford. Well, look, if there are no further questions, thank you again very much for, for coming. We, we do have a stand out there with, with some of these publications uh, available for you to, to pick up and, and take away or to look at, and we can answer any questions that you might have there. So thank you very much. <coughs>